Hi friends, in this video we are going to deal with the important and latest Supreme Court judgments pronounced now in the area of constitution, consumer and criminal laws. To know more about them, please watch the video fully. Hi friends, the important judgment which is titled Punjab State Cooperative Agricultural Development Bank Limited vs. Registrar Cooperative Societies and Others and pronounced on 11th January 2022 deals with that an amendment that has retrospective applicability and takes away the benefit which was already available to an employee under the existing set of rules would divorce the employee of his vested or accrued rights and thus will violate the rights guaranteed under articles 14 and 21 of the constitution. The facts of the case would be that the employees of Punjab State Cooperative Agricultural Development Bank Limited were members of the Employees Provident Fund scheme under the Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952. On the recommendation of the Punjab Pay Commission, the Appellant Bank introdu introduced a pension scheme for employees in 1989 through the Punjab State Cooperative Agricultural Land Markage Bank Service Common Cadre Rules 1978 and in pursuance of that, the Rules 1978 were amended to introduce Rule 15.2 which authorized the boards or Board of Directors of the Appellant Bank to formulate the intended pension scheme with prior, prior approval from Registrar of Cooperative Societies Punjab. All employees were given an option to be covered under this pension scheme or by the Act 1952. All respondent employees chose the pension scheme and derived benefit under it continuously until 2010. In May 2010, the Appellant Bank found the scheme unviable on account of a shortage of funds and sought to reconsider this pension scheme. In furtherance of this, the Appellant Bank then sent a proposal to the Registrar of Cooperative Societies stating that the pension scheme would not apply to employees employed after 1st January 2004 and that pensioners would not be given the benefit of commutation of pension, medical reimbursement and LTC among several other deductions. Although the proposal was turned down, still the board of directors of the Upland Bank decided to discontinue the pension scheme and revert to the scheme of contributory provident fund with a proposal of one-time settlement. The board of directors made amendment in Rule 15 of the Rules 1978. Pursuant thereto, Rule 15 2 stood deleted. The employees approached the High Court by filing writ petitions. The single judge held that the employees are entitled to regular pension, including revised rates of dearness allowance, to all the employees who became member of the pension scheme under the rules 1978. On appeal, the division bench held that the amendment which has taken away the vested and accrued right of the employees to get pension and that too with retrospective effect would be violative of Article 14 of the Constitution and disposed of the LPA with a declaration that amendment dated 11th March 2014 under Rules 1978 shall apply prospectively. Thus, the bank is before the Supreme Court. The question that emerges for consideration is as to what is the concept of vested or accrued rights of an employee and at the given time whether such vested or accrued rights can be divested with retrospective effect by the rule making authority. The Supreme Court has held that an amendment having retrospective operation which has the effect of taking away the benefit already available to the employee under the existing rule indeed would divorce the employee from his vested or accrued rights and that being so it would be held to be violative of rights guaranteed under articles 14 and 16 of the constitution. In the instant case the bank pension scheme was introduced from 1st April 1989 
night and options were called from the employees and those who had given their option became member of the pension scheme and accordingly pension was continuously paid to them without fail and only in the year 2010 when the bank failed in discharging its obligations respondent employees approached the high court by filing the writ petitions. The bank later on withdrawn the scheme of pension by deleting class 15-2 by an amendment which was introduced with effect from 1st April 8, 1989 and the employees who availed the benefit of pension under the scheme, indeed their rights stood vested and accrued to them and any amendment to the contrary which has been made with retrospective operation to take away the right accrued to the retired employee under the existing rule certainly is not only violative of article 14 but also of article 21 of the constitution further there is a distinction between the legitimate expectation and a wasted or accrued right in favor of the employees the rule which classifies such employee for promotional seniority age of retirement purposes undoubtedly operates on those who enter service before framing of the rules but it operates in future in a sense it governs the future right of seniority promotion or age of retirement of those who are already in service then non availability of financial resources would not be a defense available to the appellant bank in taking away the vested rights accrued to the employees that too when it is for their socio economic security Coming to the next important judgment titled Samrudhi Cooperative Housing Society Limited versus Mumbai Mahalakshmi Construction Private Limited pronounced on 11th January 2022. This judgment deals with that the failure of a builder to obtain occupation certificate is a deficiency in service under Consumer Protection Act 1986. The facts of the case would be that the appellant instituted a consumer complaint before the State Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission, Mumbai, seeking a direction to the respondent to obtain the occupation certificate. The respondent made an offer of a one-time settlement to the appellant, which the appellant refused by a letter as it was allegedly lower than the amount owed by the respondent. By its judgment order, the State Commission directed the respondent to obtain an occupancy certificate within four months. The State Commission also directed the respondent to pay Rs. 1 lakh towards reimbursement of extra water charges paid. When nothing worked, the appellant knocked the doors of the National Commission. By the impact order, the National Commission dismissed the complaint as being barred by limitation and as being not maintainable under Consumer Protection Act. 1986. The Supreme Court has held that Section 24A of the Consumer Protection Act 1986 provides for the period of limitation for lodging a complaint. A complaint to a consumer forum has to be filed within two years of the date on which the cause of action has arisen. In the instant case, the appellant has submitted that since the cause of action is founded on a continuing wrong, the complaint is within limitation. Section 22 of the Limitation Act 1963 provides for the computer commutation of limitation in the case of continuing breach of contract or tort. It provides that in case of a continuing breach of contract, a fresh period of limitation begins to run at every moment of time during which the breach continues. A continuing wrong occurs when a party continuously breaches an obligation in imposed by law or agreement. The responsibility to obtain the occupation certificate from the local authority has also been imposed under the agreement to sell between the members of the appellant and the respondent on the latter. Sections 3 and 6 of the Maharashtra Ownership Flats Regulation of the Promotion of Construction, Sale, Management and Transfer Act 1963 indicate that the promoter has an obligation to provide the occup occupancy certificate to the flat owners. Apart from this, the promoter must make payments of outgoing such as ground rent, municipal taxes, water charges and the electricity charges till the time the property is transferred to the flat owners. 
charges. Where the promoter fails to pay such charges, the promoter is liable even after the transfer of the property. Owing to the failure of the respondent to obtain the certificate, there has been a direct impact on the members of the appellant in terms of the payment of higher taxes and water charges to the municipal authority. This continuous failure to obtain an occupancy certificate is a breach of the obligations imposed on the respondent under the Maharashtra Ownership Flats Regulation of the Promotion of Construction, Sale, Management and Transfer Act 1963 and amounts to a continuing wrong. The appellants, therefore, are entitled to damages arising out of this continuing wrong and their complaint, complaint is not barred by limitation. Further, Section 21D of the Consumer Protection Act defines a consumer as a person that avails of any service for a consideration. A deficiency is defined under Section 21G as the shortcoming or inadequacy in the quality of service that is required to be maintained by law. In the present case, the respondent was responsible for transferring the title to the flats to the society along with the occupancy certificate. The failure of the respondent to obtain the occupation certificate is a deficiency in service for which the respondent is liable. Thus, the members of the Appellant Society are well within their rights as consumers to pray for compensation as a recompense recompense for the consequent liability such as payment of higher taxes and water charges by the owners arising from the lack of the occupancy certificate. Therefore, the complaint is maintainable. Hi friends, now we are going to deal with the important judgment titled State of Madhya Pradesh versus Jokendra and another pronounced on 11th January 2022. This judgment deals with that demand of money for construction of a house is a dowry demand to attract offence under Section 304B of the Indian Penal Code. The facts of the case would be that the charge sheet was filed against the accused and the case was committed for trial in the Sessions Court. After examining the evidence produced by the prosecution and the def defense, the trial court acquitted accused 3, the mother-in-law and accused 4, the brother-in-law of the deceased, but convicted both the respondents, the accused 1 and 2, who are husband and father-in-law of the deceased, under sections 304B, 306 and 498A of IPC. On appeal, the High Court held that the demand of money for construction of a house cannot be treated as a demand for dowry. The court further observed that the offence under Section 304B was not established against them as the demand allegedly made on the deceased was for money to construct, construct a house which cannot be treated as a dowry demand for connecting her death to the said cause. Agreed by the said judgment, the present appeal has been filed by the State of Madhya Pradesh. The Supreme Court has held that the most fundamental constituent for attracting the provisions of Section 304B of IPC is that the death of a woman must be a dowry death. The evidence brought on record shows that the deceased was pressurized to make such a request for money to her mother and uncle. It was not a case of complicity but a case of sheer a helplessness faced by the deceased in such adverse circumstances. The evidence brought on record also demonstrates that the harassment of the deceased for money had commenced within a few months of her marriage and had continued thereafter on several occasions. This fact is borne out from the deposition of PW1. When all the four prerequisites for invoking the provision of Section 304B of IPC stand satisfied, namely that the death of the deceased took place at her matrimonial home within seven years of her marriage, that the said death took place in abnormal circumstances on account of burning and that too when she was five months pregnant, that she had been subjected to cruelty and harassment by the respondent soon before her death and such cruelty or harassment was in connection with demand for dowry. Taking into account the evidence brought on record by the prosecution, particularly the testimony of PW1, 
the analysis of the trial court was correct and the respondent deserved to be convicted under section 304b and 498a of ipc however the findings written by the high court not to be disturbed that has acquitted the respondents for the offense of abatement to commit suicide under section 300b of ipc as the prosecution could not bring any conclusive evidence on record to satisfactorily dem demonstrate that it was due to the abatement on the part of the respondents that the deceased co had committed suicide by immolating herself accordingly the judgment of conviction and sentence passed by the trial court in respect of both the respondents under section 304b and section 498a of ipc is restored however the sentence imposed on them by the trial court of a rigorous imprisonment for life is reduced to that of 7 years which is the minimum sentence prescribed for an offense under section 304b of ipc